Hello everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith and I am excited today to be beginning the showcase for Madara Unintentional Malum Act Number 1. In a regular showcase for a board game here on Rolling Solo, we typically do the solo setup first before we move into the playthrough, but I want to make mention of the fact there are some fantastic videos on the Succubus Publishing YouTube channel that you can go check out. Multiple videos, actually, if you want to check out videos based on lore or based on the specific types or ways you can play Madara, whether it's the adventure mode or the crawl mode. In this particular showcase, we'll be focusing on the adventure mode which is going to take us through this gigantic book here now of course we're not going to go through the entire campaign we're going to leave that for you to discover as you go through this massive massive book but i'm going to do a handful of scenarios out of here so you get a good idea as to how the in-between game works the actual scenarios work the rules work the game flows all that stuff we'll cover as well as tracking your characters handling them managing them all of that good stuff now first off before we get moving into how we're going to actually Actually play this showcase through in solo fashion I want to direct your attention to two videos from Succubus Publishing's YouTube channel. The first video is the How to Play One Component Overview video. Definitely go check that one out. If you've just ripped Madeira open for the first time, you are going to have a ton of content. If you haven't seen my unboxing for either the core game or for the promo box, you're going to realize really, really quickly there is a ton of content to go through and it can be slightly overwhelming. So if you want a video that's going to get you up to speed on how to organize and understand what you're looking at, that component overview is vital. Next thing in line, once you've actually watched that video, is to check out the How to Play Getting Started video, which is basically going to get you started. It's going to take you from having your components organized on the table to a place of almost getting ready to begin your very first dive into a scenario. And that's where you're going to basically be able to jump in where I'm currently going to be starting, which is into the setup of a scenario in the adventure mode. So once you've gotten those two videos from Succubus Publishing down pat and you're back here ready to watch more, we're going to move into the next step, which is talking about the two-player and three-player variants here that are available inside of Madeira, not only on the actual website for Succubus Publishing, where you can go to the download section to find the files for that, but in the promo box, they actually included the linked adventure cards, which allow for the two-player variant and three-player variant to come to life. Now we'll talk more about how it works, but a quick overview in general is Madara, this particular adventure book, has you bringing four characters that are unlocked from the very beginning of the game. Essentially, you have access to those four. Playing the two-player variant does not restrict the characters you have access to or access to upgrade. It essentially just means you're only bringing two characters into a particular scenario at a time. When you choose the two of the four that you want to bring in in the first scenario, you then just take the other two characters you didn't use, you find their linked adventurer cards, and you link them to whichever of the other two that you've brought into the scenario that you want. The really cool thing with this is that those linked adventurer cards are going to have abilities specific to the two characters you're not using, which are then going to become inherited into the two characters you are using. Plus, you get a double up on health, you get an extra stamina point, and this is the way in which they go ahead and allow for only control of two players going through the campaign versus four, but also kind of bolstering those two players to the point that they can handle more damage and also have some extra abilities so it's almost as if you have four players present but less management less onerous and uh, fiddliness on the table and less things to make mistakes while playing and it's quicker to actually move through scenarios without having to deal with all the movement rules and everything else so you might be able to pack in a couple more games in a night than you typically would if you were playing with all four characters at once so with my off-camera plays before we pulled into this showcase here, I definitely, definitely preferred the two-player variant over the three-player or the four-player when playing solo. 
So what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna show you exactly how that looks. We're gonna put those two characters I've chosen for the showcase on the table. We're gonna put their items out, their initiative cards out, their uh, actual miniatures out. We're gonna grab the linked adventure cards. We're gonna connect them into the two characters we're gonna use. And we're gonna dive into that very first scenario. But just before we do that, we're gonna go ahead and dive into the story of what and where we currently are. Chapter one. Before the mast, Nightingale crept almost silently through the crowd, eyes fixed on her target. There were at least a hundred of her fellow students here, thronging about and chatting excitedly in their teams of four. Her victim wasn't watching anything but the cigarette in his fingers. He didn't stand a chance. Air rushed around Nightingale as she jumped, latching onto Zeke's back with both arms like a monkey around a tree. Zeke! Her voice came out somewhere between a squeal and a screech, loud enough that a few nearby students turned to stare. Her friend grunted and spluttered, the cigarette tumbling away from his mouth. You trying to kill me? Nightingale dropped to the ground behind him. You don't need my help for that. She extinguished the still smoldering cigarette with a well-placed step. You've been here as long as I have, two years away from Earth and you're still poisoning yourself. Zeke only grinned in response. It also makes you smell terrible, someone said from behind them. They both turned, and Nightingale's eyes widened as she saw her sister Shayla standing there. Nightingale was usually thrilled to see her, but today was different. Today, Shayla was one of the proctors on the most important test of their new lives, the Magical Aptitude and Skill Test, or the MAST for short. Makes me smell terrible, Zeke scoffed. See, here I was expecting something like, It's so good to see you, Zeke. Or maybe, How'd you do on your written exams? You know, friend stuff. No favoritism today, Shayla said. She sounded stern, but she was grinning at them as she flipped through a few pages on a worn clipboard. Oh, but look at that. Lucky you. Looks like you two ended up together. What a surprise, Nightingale smiled and shared a look with Zeke. Consider that the only luck you get today, Shayla commented quietly. Nightingale looked around, wondering who their other partners would be. Of course, she and Zeke would be in a group together. She knew why Shayla didn't want to broadcast it, though, although students would be quick to pick up on any nepotism. While Nightingale knew each one of the students around them, the really short girl with multicolored eyes, the kid with the strange goat-like hooves instead of feet, none of them were actually friends. Each team has four people, Zeke said. Who are the other two? Rook Lars and Remy, Moretti. Shayla frowned at the clipboard for a moment, then shrugged and tucked it away under one arm. You need me to point them out? Nah, we're good. Zeke rested one hand briefly on Nightingale's shoulder, pointing towards the single largest student in the room. I see Rook there. If you're not already, get acquainted. I've only got another few teams to assign before I explain everything. Shayless walked away, vanishing effortlessly into the crowd. Guess it makes sense. Rook's gotta be the smartest student here and the best fighter in our class, Zeke said. They started walking towards him, Nightingale leaving it to Zeke to clear a path for them. She lowered her voice so that the other students nearby couldn't hear her. Sure, Rook makes sense. Remy, though? Isn't her dad some kind of mafioso? Who thought it was a good idea to pair someone like that with royalty? Couldn't make it look like favoritism, I'd bet, so they pick us a boat anchor to balance out our shared awesomeness, Zeke shrugged. Every team has four. So long as she doesn't slow us down, we'll be fine. It looked like the other half of their team was already assembled. Rook was easily doubled the size of Nightingale, with hands like hammers and a beard like a lion. Hey, Zeke, Rook called. They met with a bone-cracking embrace. Remy stood just behind him, arms folded awkwardly in front of her. She looked up, smiling politely and extending a hand. Hey, I guess we're together for the test, Princess Nightingale Arson, ma'am. Remy peered at Nightingale through impressive multicolored dreadlocks. Her massive owl-like wings folded behind her, making Remy's small frame look a little bigger. Just Nightingale, she corrected Remy, taking the offered hand. The title gets old quick. You're Remy, right? Yeah. Remy looked past her, up to the gigantic rook who was still talking with Zeke. I know I'm probably not the sort of teammate you were hoping for. Nightingale blushed, unable to meet her eyes. Had Remy somehow overheard her talking to Zeke on the way over? 
She didn't get a chance to respond because at that moment her sister stepped up onto a raised platform at the edge of the hall and started shouting, All right, listen up, everyone. They did. Shayla smiled. Welcome to the Magical Aptitude and Skill Test. If any of you have doubts about your ability to complete the mast, the door's right there. She gestured behind them all, towards the towering double doors that led into the castle's main hall. A few stern teachers stood there, their armor polished and their weapons sharp. You will be required to go through the Acerbis, the Academy's training dungeon. The Acerbis is the real deal. Don't think the force fields of the bellicose cubes make up for stupid mistakes, because they don't. These monsters will kill you if you're not careful. There were a few seconds of silence. Nobody left, and Shayla's expression grew more intense. All right, we're going to walk through the doors behind the armory. Each of you is entitled to one pack of supplies. Choose wisely. If you get halfway through the test before you realize you didn't bring something important, too bad. She paused waiting for her statement to sink in. If you have any last questions, ask either me or another proctor before you get into the dungeon. Once the test starts, you'll only get my help if things go very wrong. She raised her voice, glancing once around the room. For the sake of your grades, you do not want our help. There were no questions. Shayla's turned, hopping off the edge of the platform. Please follow me to the armory. All right, so now we have some options here in terms of which characters we want to actually choose to use in this two-player variant. I'm going to be going ahead and using Remy and Rook. Those are the two characters that I'm going to choose to bring into this very first scenario. And I'm going to use linked adventurer cards from Nightingale and Zeke to tie into those two characters, almost exactly how they are here in Columns. So if I was playing this in a four-player capacity, I would basically grab all four of the character cards here, as well as every single card that's mentioned here. And that would basically load up my characters from the armory with with what the predetermined loadout should be based on this gigantic book and the story we're going through here. But because we're playing a two-player variant, I'm going to get to choose from this pool of characters, and I'm choosing Remy and Rook, so we're going to gather all the martial discipline cards. They're going to, we're going to grab the Sanctus discipline cards, the mundane items for both, and also those linked adventure cards, put them all out on the table, and continue on with the story. The armory was well-stocked, and none of them would go into the dungeon wanting. After selecting their gear, they made their way to an old freight lift that was operated with pulleys and ropes. There was only enough room on the lift for the four of them, and no pesky safety features like rails. A burly proctor Nightingale recognized as an archery instructor stood just behind the lift. Someone keep a hand on the rope at all times, he warned. If you let go, the fall will kill you. Got it, Rook answered. He was the first to climb aboard, taking hold of the control rope with one gigantic fist. The rest of them followed him aboard, and they started down. This is gonna be awesome! Nightingale looked down at the firefly lights of the glowstones illuminating the carved stone patterns of the dungeon below. Even if it's a trial dungeon, it's about time we get out of the classroom. Zeke nodded. I just can't wait to graduate. We're so close to becoming real citizens. No more lectures, no more exams. Remy shuffled near the edge of the lift her wings twitching a little in the slight breeze. Yeah, she said, her voice barely a squeak in the dark. Shayless was waiting at the bottom of the lift, in a cavernous room cut from rough stone. Several passages opened away in all directions. Down some of the tunnels, lights were trailing away, and voices were echoing as groups set out on their separate paths. You ready, little sis? Shayless gestured down a dark hallway. That one's yours. I'm ready. Nightingale drew her weapon and raised it enthusiastically. Nothing down there stands a chance. I'm sure it doesn't. Shayla smiled and reached out, wrapping one arm around Nightingale in a quick hug. Shayla turned, meeting each of their eyes slowly. Take care of each other. Your team shares one grade, so your citizenship depends on it. With a nod, she tugged on the rope, and at once the rickety elevator started to rise. Good luck. Zeke waved at her as she disappeared. He turned and headed towards the indicated pathway. His expression wilted as he got his first look at what waited for them. Damp stone, thick cobwebs, and the smell of decay. Let's get this over with. They left the first room behind, the sound of squeaking metal pulleys fading into the distance. The stone was thick here, too thick to hear what any of the other groups might be doing. 
Soon enough, they were left with nothing but their own footsteps and the light of their glowstones. They didn't have far to go before they reached the first of the bellicose cubes. It was a small relic, only about a foot across, and set into the stone wall of the cavern. Intricate carvings of cruer magic pulsed with red lights as they neared the basin at the front. I always hate using these things, though I guess they've kept me safe in a couple of sparring matches. Remy frowned down at the cube as she approached it. It's better than getting killed, Rook stated. I bet the proctors put them here so that they have time to intervene if we're defeated by monsters, or if we suffer an otherwise fatal fall. Just make sure to attune yourself with it. Without putting in your blood, it won't protect you. Attuned or not, fighting will still hurt, Zeke added. I broke an arm while learning to use a sword. Guy cheap shotted me. Rook nodded in agreement. Zeke's right. I've broken other students' arms while learning to use a sword. He smiled at Zeke and then got serious. Seriously, though, the cube will let us survive very serious wounds. But it doesn't make us invulnerable. Don't be an idiot. Nightingale winced as she cut her hand along the blade of her weapon, just deep enough that a few drops of blood welled up in her palm. A few drops fell from her pale fingers into the bowl. One by one, they struck and boiled away, and the glow of the cube grew much brighter. For just a moment, she felt as though all the blood in her body was being tugged towards the cube. The strange sensation passed, and she got out of the way. They all took their turns before they could finally advance into the encroaching gloom. So now that we have the story behind us and a little bit of a setup as to what's really truly going on here, we're going to dive into the mass scenario for day number one. It says at the very top of the page here, the damp, cold air of the cave chills you to the bone. As your eyes adjust to the dark, you see the faint outline of a large rock blocking the path up ahead. It looks as if a strong push could send the boulder careening into the pits on either side of it. In any case, it looks like the only way forward. You'll also note on this page that it always specifies where or what type of location you found yourself in. In this particular case, we found ourselves in a underground location in a northern region. You'll see here as well that we have three tiles we have to find, which are easily found right here in the setup, and they're numbered so you can find them quickly. We're going to grab those and place them in the center of the table right away here. But first, we'll continue through the rest of the setup. We've got one obstructing terrain tile, which we know is the rock in the center. We have a totem here in blue and in red. Both are going to be sitting on this particular tiles in these particular positions. And we also have one blue loot token, which will sit right here and one blue exit token up here. So we're going to go ahead and set those up, but I first want to talk quickly about the end conditions for this scenario. It says here the win condition is an adventurer needs to end their turn on the blue exit. That is one adventure. There's no S there. It's just a single adventure. It needs to reach this exit in order to win. Losing is if all the adventures are defeated. So we know going into this, we already have some information. We know certain things are on the map. Some things are hidden and unknown. We've got some totems we have to deal with. And of course, you guys probably don't know how those totems work necessarily, if this is the first time you've seen a playthrough from Madeira. But there is going to be some surprises involved with that when we actually get into the playthrough. We've got special encounter rules right here talking about how the movable rock will actually be able to be moved. So it says an adventure adjacent to the obstructing terrain, which is that rock token, on tile UM1 may make, a, um, may make an encounter action, is what it's called, to make a strength 10 skill check. And if they pass it, they move the obstructing terrain token onto an adjacent unoccupied space. If the space the token is moved on to is dangerous terrain, discard the token. So the next thing underneath that is grading. So there's a grading going on based on the success that you have during this encounter. And it's right here. It says during this encounter of the mass, you'll be graded on how many rounds it took you to finish the encounter and how many opponents you also defeated. Use time tokens to keep track of how many rounds have passed. At the end of the encounter, consult the chart below to determine your score. And you keep track of the score using the notes section on the adventure sheet. Your score for each encounter can never fall below zero. So you've got all the different things here based on how many turns it took us we get a certain number of points and that's going to be reflected in whatever happens later on in the story we also says down here that each cave sickle defeated gives us two points and each adventure defeated loses us five points so we kind of have some 
uh, information up front that's a little bit spoilerish, but we still don't really know how the blue totem's gonna act or how the red totem's gonna act or even what's in the blue loot. Again, this is one of the coolest things about Madeira is the fact that this information is hidden. There's always gonna be something in these scenarios you're gonna have no idea about and it's one of the best things about this book. All right, and just like that, we've got the scenario board set up here. So exactly as it states in the scenario book, three tiles in a row, we've got the rock sitting straight in the middle there across that rickety rock bridge, basically. We've got a blue totem here, a red totem here. The exit we're trying to get one of our adventurers to in order to succeed as quick as humanly possible. And also we have a blue loot token, which is drawing our interest quite heavily across the canyon there. All right, and here's the loadout for our first hero, Remy. Now you'll notice here to the left, there is a card called the Linked Adventurer card. This Linked Adventure card is really the backbone of how this two player variant works. And essentially, if we were playing four characters and bringing all of them into this scenario, we would not be using these Linked Adventure cards. But I have four characters to draw from, from my pool of characters that are currently unlocked in the adventure mode from the start. So I can actually bring two characters truly into this scenario. Remy is one, Rook will be the other in a second. I'll show you that side of the board. But I can also bring in the other unlocked adventures in a linked adventurer form and then link them to a character and thereby giving them an upgrade to their health. So normally Remy would go in with 12 health, but with a linked adventure, we'll gain an extra 12 health. So now a 24 health character. And that's essentially the beauty of streamlining lining this for solo getting a stronger character that can handle more damage, but not just damage. Also the ability here as well to use some of Nightingale's cool abilities. So this one here says a status, so gain one extra stamina point through this linked adventure. So that's really handy as well. And then down below here, you've got an exhaust, uh, the thing that you can actually use as well, that allows you when you roll that particular star, an ally within SOI gains an extra stamina point. And we'll talk more about what SOI is when we actually get into the gameplay. Uh, this symbol may also be spent when determining the force of a spell. So just something to keep in mind that if we roll that with Remy, we can use that ability as so long as we exhaust this card. There is a phase within the game where cards become unexhaust. So every single time I initiate, I should be able to use that, uh, you know, as well as I can remember to use it is the hope. We've also got a whole bunch of other cards here that come with that preset loadout for Remy. We have her War Axe here which is gonna allow us to roll two white dice, as you can see right there. And it's also a two-handed weapon, and uh, it's a melee weapon. And so we're gonna to have to be adjacent in order to actually make an attack. We exhaust this card if we so choose. It says when determining damage, this weapon gains an extra book, essentially, and it, or basically what it's gaining. It's not the book, but it's allowing us, if we roll a book, to gain plus one physical damage until the attack is resolved. So basically, if we roll dice, which you will see later on have a a ton of icons on them we can really start pumping up that damage pretty heavily and exhausting the war axe again is a one-time thing and becomes unexhausted later on at the very bottom of the card there's also other skills or i should say symbols that can appear on the dice that you can also spend until you literally run out of those symbols to spend in order to continue to beef up things so that whole idea of making a regular attack and then having the attack become a really powerful attack is part of this game and it's really exciting to see it happen over here we have some armor, the occult shirt. So this thing is not going to actually improve uh, armor whatsoever. It's a zero. Other armor we may find later on is going to. Um, they can also improve your health, but in this case it doesn't. But it does increase her actual movement. So she'll be able to move seven spaces if she so chooses to. And uh, exhaust here, we can exhaust to dodge. If the attack deals no damage, we can unexhaust this card and counter. We'll talk more about that in combat. We have an ability core here which also gives us a nice little boost to defense so instead of it just being a nine we now have ten uh, and we also have the ability to exhaust this in order to counter again more so used in the attacking phase we also have consumables over here so she really likes her throwing knife she's got two of those if you discard them you get to throw or roll a purple die and literally whatever the damage states on the die is what the damage is done to the enemy so it can be pretty nasty but once those are used they're gone but they're relatively cheap and we could likely buy them back in the future. 
We have the Vitality Juice Box as well. This one's a discard. It's a potion. It says you or an adjacent ally can heal three. So simply just allowing you to get some healing back. And that essentially wraps up what Remy can do besides her natural ability, which is really, really cool. Remy's natural ability for two stamina, which is this red circle right here, you'll see that there's three red circles in a row of five. Five is the max, essentially, and she has three stamina points to start, although now that we're playing the two-player variant, she will actually gain an extra stamina point uh, from the linked adventure, giving her four stamina points going in, which is awesome, uh, so a lot more. But we'll also talk more about how the two-player variant changes all of that later on uh, but mainly i wanted to mention this stamina so you understand that the natural flight ability she has costs two stamina to use she's a gifted flyer she's able to make a move and then remy has flight for the duration of the movement meaning she can basically fly over these giant canyons or crevices that we're finding underground all right, and over here on the right-hand side of the board, we have Rook Lars, and this guy is a gigantic beast who is dual-wielding Warhammers, so he does not mess around. So you can see here, he's got Warhammers. Each of them allow him to roll a die each, and they're single-handed weapons, so we can use both of them at the same time. He can exhaust them to empower them, empower them as part of the attack, and allows you to basically pull in a black die and basically get better results. So if you're exhausting his Warhammers, he can do that. He can also do a combo move with them. It says if you have two Warhammers, equipped a single warhammer gains heavy we'll talk about that later on but that's something to note as well because it does start to affect movement we also have these symbols down at the very bottom so if he gets double shields or he gets the star he can increase his physical damage and as long as he has those emblems to spend he can literally keep spending them to just keep beefing up that attack which is pretty crazy He's got himself a Curus. Uh, this can exhaust, and when you are dealt damage, reduce the physical damage dealt to you by two. So that's actually a really, really useful armor because it actually not only gives him a point of armor always, as it says plus one right there, so his armor would actually uh, already be up and be able to stop uh, damage from coming in at him, but he also can exhaust this armor in order to prevent physical damage from being dealt, which is nice. He's got a deflection core over here, which this one is going to actually up his defense total to 10, making him harder to actually get a successful hit on him. So basically, defense works first, armor works afterwards. Defense is kind of what the, the attack needs to make in order to hit, and then your actual armor is going to be what's going to stop you from taking hits, essentially. And of course, if you have a, a, a abilities that allow you to exhaust things, to reduce damage, well, you're going to want to go ahead and do those as often as you can, unless, of course, you just feel like being a tank and taking all that damage. Um, for Rook, Rook has 14 health, so a little bit more of a tank in that in that way. Linked Adventure card-wise, we have Zeke, and again, it's one extra stamina point, so we'll be starting with four for Rook, so we might as well put another red one right there just to remember that. We likely will do that later on, or I'll just constantly remember, but I'll probably have to put something there. I'll forget. Uh, passively, we're gaining 12 health, but he has 14, so he's going to have 26 health. So that's another thing we'll have to remember. It also says once per turn, we can re-roll re uh, the dodge roll, which is awesome because it's not something we have to exhaust. We literally can just do that every single time, or sorry, once per turn, but just over and over and over again every turn, which is cool. Uh, we also have two consumables over here, Magic Balm, <laughs> which is hilarious. Uh, this one says discard it, remove an effect from an ally within uh, SOI. So again, something we'll talk about how that works later when we deal with movement and everything else. Hyper Energy HP Potion, discard this, an ally within uh, SOI heals three and gains one stamina point. So it's actually even more powerful than the juice box that Remy has because it gives you an extra stamina point on top of it. Now, one card that I missed talking about in Remy's portion there was about this right here. So each of our characters have these special uh, cards or abilities basically that they can gain through disciplines that they're following. And uh, Rook here, is under the Sanctus, so level one, and this is the one from the mundane list that he gets to, to have to start. And this one says, uh, per encounter, gain two heal, uh, heal tokens. So when these tokens are spent to heal an ally other than yourself, gain a, uh, a uh, stamina point, which is fantastic. So if he's healing Remy, he's gaining stamina. So that's pretty cool. The one from Remy that I missed mentioning when I went through hers is a hammer helm. It says it's a passive one. It says your attacks gain one physical damage damage 
all the time, just always. So that's gonna be something we're gonna to wanna to remember a lot. We can also exhaust this card. It says when making a melee attack, if you have a two-handed weapon equipped, which I do, you may reroll any dice in your combat dice pool. So really helpful for when you get those rolls that don't pan out for you. So those are important. And of course, those abilities will expand and become much better as time goes on and you upgrade your character. There's a whole, there's a whole pile for each of them. So for instance, if we, we don't have a character, actually I shouldn't say that, uh, Remy is of the Marshal. So this basically is going to correlate itself to this gigantic deck of Marshal cards. And it starts with level one at the very bottom. It goes all the way up to level four. And these are all the different things that potentially Remy could uh, dive into in the future, but only start at the very basement level to begin. So that is pretty much everything. The only other thing I didn't mention was this Deflection Core's uh, abilities here. Passively, Conviction Upgrade, White Die. So when we do Conviction, we'll talk about what that is later. Flipping this card when Make a Conviction Check, Pass a convi Conviction Check. So we can flip the whole card over, and that's got a whole other uh, ball of wax to explain, but basically we can flip it over to just automatically pass something. Uh, his actual natural ability is surprisingly and unsurprisingly, it's just unsurprisingly, his grand physique, of course, because it takes up 90% of the card, his massive muscles. He's got a passive ability here. It says Rook's unmodified maximum HP is 14 and he may equip an additional consumable. So he can equip more consumables than most people. Again, we'll talk about that when we start hitting limits on the amount of items. There's no point in gumming up the waters with all these rules until we actually hit them. Also on the back of each of the characters that you choose, those those character cards you can flip them over and there is actually a story or backstory for each of the characters that you're playing as so if you want to you can pause the screen now in order to read this you can get an idea as to the backstory for Remy and in the exact same manner, you can also flip over the character card for Rook and you'll see a backstory for him as well. So if you'd like to read that, you can pause the screen and digest all of that content. And then we're gonna dive right into the final steps before we drop our adventures in this scenario and begin exploring. The next really important thing to set up is the loot deck, or the combatant loot deck, and it really is dependent on which level you're currently at. So each of the scenarios in the scenario book are going to mention whether they're at a mundane level, common level, uncommon level, or rare level within the actual scenario. And our first scenario is the mundane level. So you simply go ahead and build that combatant loot deck comprised of all the cards mentioned here. It's pretty straightforward. You'll have a whole bunch of combatant loot cards when you first go ahead and organize the game, you're simply gonna grab one unique, one monster, one item, five of the nines, five of the eights, five of the sevens, five of the six, four of the fives, and three of the fours. Shuffle them all together and you've got your deck created. The next thing you wanna do is go ahead and grab all the stamina that you should have on your character. And of course, even though it states one, two, three stamina here for Rook, we gain an extra stamina because of the linked adventure card that states we gain one extra stamina point. So four for each of our characters, both of them have four of these points on top of their character card to represent that. We also have the dice pool all ready to go as well as more stamina and damage tokens within easy reach. All right, so I got some other tokens out that are ready for this scenario. The first set is the urgency tokens, which we'll talk about right now quickly. These represent the adventurer's race against time. They're used to keep the game moving and prevent you from abusing certain abilities within the game. Now, we probably aren't gonna see those abilities that are really that powerful up front, but later on we might. And at the end of a round in which no opponent had an AI step, so in other words, no enemy had an AI step with a true condition, and no opponents were spawned, then we put an urgency token at the end of the initiative track. And if we ever have four, and once we get that fourth urgency token, all adventures are defeated. So it's basically removed. All those urgency tokens will be removed at the end of a scenario, but it's essentially keeping you from gaming the system. We also have time tokens here as well. There's a one on one side, three on the other, and we're gonna be keeping track of how many rounds it takes us to defeat the scenario as stated in the scenario book. As you probably already noticed, we've already got the initiative track set up here right above the scenario board. Essentially, what you're gonna do is how whichever characters you're controlling at the beginning of a scenario, you're gonna make sure that they're all flipped over like this. You're gonna take them into a pile, shuffle them up, and randomly create the initiative uh, track using these cards without knowing the order. I've already done this off camera, and Remy actually landed front and center, and Rook going afterwards. Now, if we were playing four characters 
characters and controlling those. We are playing four characters, but if we are controlling four characters within the scenario, uh, then we have four initiative cards. We'd be shuffling them all together and randomly dialing them out as well. Uh, with a two-player variant, it makes that whole process much simpler. You're simply shuffling the two cards of the two characters you chose to bring in. You do not bring in the initiative cards for the linked adventures. You're simply just taking advantage of their abilities. Another thing that's really useful to have on the table is the reference card, and every player in the game can have one of these in front of them. It's going to show you your standard actions, your standard abilities, and these are literally going to show you every single thing you can spend stamina points on when your character activates, which is super handy, and you definitely want to keep this close by. Now, on the opposite side of this particular card, you're going to find the adventurer's turn that's going to actually dictate how the adventure is going to pan out, the start of turn phase, the status phase, the refresh phase, the action phase, and the end of turn phase, a full adventurer's turn. All right, now it's time to get our heroes onto the game board. So first off, the starting positions can be either of these spaces or either of these spaces. Basically everything on this side of the board except this area right here. So we're going to go ahead and place Remy right like this. And we're going to have Rook go right over here so we can kind of beeline our way straight through the middle. Now there's a bunch of things on the tiles that I want to get into in terms of specifics based on different patterns that you're seeing where there's dotted lines, solid lines, different colors. Um, we want to go through all of those things so you guys understand that and as we move through our very first round of play you'll get very familiar with all of those rules as we go.